you're going to find uh, something about David today that's a little surprising. Uh, he, he's a lot like Jesus. Jesus was surprising a lot of the time. And so is David. Now there's some strong parallels here between David and Jesus. We've been talking about that kind of thing for a long time now. Some of the parallels that you'll find are similar. Similar parallels. And that means that there are things about David that are like Jesus. There are other parallels that are just not similar at all. They're the opposite. David is one way. Jesus is another. But they, they speak about the same subject. And Jesus is the is the one that we follow. And he is the one who corrects whatever image David did not portray well. First thing we see here in the story is that Joab is told that David is at back in the, in, the, uh, in the room above the gate and he is mourning. I understand mourning. When my daughter died, I understood mourning for the first time in a really deep and significant way. And for David to lose his son... I know that it can be overwhelming, so overwhelming that you tend to forget about everything else that's going on in the world. I may have shared with you before, going into a public place like a, like a, a, a grocery store and seeing people going about their lives as if there was nothing unusual that had happened. And for me, my whole life was totally, you know, turned upside down on its head. And I couldn't believe that they didn't have any sensitivity toward that. And I think David is feeling the same thing. It's very easy when you're grieving, and you're grieving with really great sorrow, that your world becomes very small. And you're unaware of things that are going on outside of you because you are so focused on the sorrow and the pain that you're feeling. Unfortunately, David didn't have, he didn't have that opportunity at the beginning here when he hears about his son's death. Also to hear that his son died violently and died dishonorably. And those kinds of things were just overwhelming to him. So Joab was told that he was weeping and mourning for Absalom. That would be no surprise. And that the whole army, and for the whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. Because on that day the troops heard it said the king is grieving for his son. Now you can understand that if you are a soldier and you're loyal to David, you love your king and you win a victory for him that you will find a great deal of conflicting emotions when you come back to the place where he is knowing that his son was killed in the process and well, you're, you're the army that was responsible for that. And yet at the same time your army delivered him. Your army saved his kingdom, saved his life and the life of his wives and children. So you're conflicted. You're not sure what to do. But David has only got one thing on his mind, and that is the sorrow. He is not aware of what that effect will be upon his soldiers. They're coming in, and it says here in the scriptures that they steal in. They steal in as those who are ashamed when they have deserted the battle. When they flee the battle, there is a lot of shame involved in that kind of thing. When there is no courage. And yet that wasn't the case. And still they are coming into this city of Maonahim, this fortress of Maonahim. And they are afraid to look at David in the face. They're afraid he will be there and look at them. And they hear him weeping. David is not crying quietly. He is weeping loudly. And here we see something that's really symbolic of his particular situation. It says, the king covered his face and cried aloud, Oh, my son, Absalom, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The key here is he covers his face. He is so consumed with his own situation that he cannot see what effect it's having on those around him. He needs somebody to help him. You see, this is not a place where he should be going. Now, you say to yourself, well, he has the grief. And, and it's wrong when people don't really uh, let out their emotions when they try to crunch them in. And they, they deny what they're feeling. Yes, all of those things are true. When we grieve, we should indeed be free to grieve in the ways in which are customary for us. But then there are some things in life that transcend our own personal sorrow. And this is one of those occasions when these men are coming home, they need a word from David. They need him to say something to them because they don't know how they should feel. They feel sorrow and they feel exhilaration 
and uh, they're ashamed because now they've killed David's son and, and he's weeping and this is the king they love and they follow and they don't know what to do. They need a word from David, but his face is covered and he cannot see. Do you ever find yourself in that kind of a situation? You, you get so consumed with your own issues that you cannot listen to others. When I was a kid, I was like 13 years old, 11, 12, something like that. I had, that age may be totally wrong. I can't remember exactly when it happened. But anyway, there was a point in my life that I had to have teeth taken out every Monday. I had baby teeth that were not being cooperative. They wanted to stay. They liked me a lot. <laughs> and the second teeth were coming in all around them. I was going to have two full sets of teeth if they didn't do something about it. And unfortunately, the thing that they had to do about it was pull out all of the baby teeth three or four every week with this gigantic long needle that he shoved into my mouth. I, I was terrified. Monday became terrible. And you know, on, Monday, on Sunday night and Monday morning, you know, you could have the worst problems in the world and I wouldn't hear it. Because all I was thinking of was, I'm heading to the dentist's office. I'm going to die. And I cannot hear you because my, my concerns, my worries, trump yours. And that's wrong. That's wrong. It's, it's understandable for a kid. But for a grown-up who is a king, or for an adult who is a parent, or a man who is working in a workplace, or a woman who is working in a workplace, there are times when our feelings should not trump the needs of others that are around us. Jesus gave us such a good example of this when he was on the cross. As he hung there in incredible pain, he looks down upon the people in front of him and says to one, he says, Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. You see, he understood that Mary now needed someone to care for her, for her and he wanted it to be John. And so even as he's hanging there on the cross, he is meeting the needs of his mother as he's being nailed to the cross. He's asking God to forgive those who are nailing the nails into his wrists and his feet. As he's hanging there on the cross, he's listening to the thief on his left or on his right, I don't know which it was. And, and, the, and the man's saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. You see, there are times when we're tempted to let our pain shut out other people, shut out our kids, shut out our friends, shut out our, bro our husband or our wife, and that shouldn't be. We need to be able to say, you're important to me, and I will listen, I will grieve later, I will sorrow later, I will do something, whatever it may be, later. And so Joab has to come to David to wake him up about this. Now you understand that Joab is the man who finds, or he doesn't initially find, but he's told that Absalom, David's son, is hanging in a tree by his hair, and Joab goes with three spears in his hand, and he deposits them into his heart. Now, now David knows that Joab is responsible for Absalom's death. He knows this. But Absalom is not about to let David lose his kingdom because of the sorrow that he's feeling for his son. So he comes in and he speaks to him. He went into the house and says, Today you have humiliated all your men you, who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you and you hate those who love you. You've made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom was alive today. All of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come upon you from your youth till now. I was having a Bible study this week with the Koreans, uh, the students at Biblical. And I said to them, you, you, you understand the drama going on here, don't you? And I said, you know, you understand the whole idea of honor and respect for those who are in authority over you. You look at this and you go, I can't believe he's saying this. And they all agreed with me. They said, we would never say 
anything like that. Sometimes pastors in Korea will tell their assistant pastors that they are never to correct them. They are never to come and confront them. And they don't because there is honor and you cannot speak to your elder or you cannot speak to somebody in authority. Remember that, Joel? And, uh, <laughs> and yet, Joab is a loose cannon. You understand loose cannon, don't you? Cannons are only good if they're tightly held by the, the base that is under them. If they have any looseness in the cannon, well, you know that somebody could get killed that you don't intend to kill. All right? That's what Joab is. And we've talked about that before. So Joab comes in, he knows what to do, and he just bellows at his king. He says, well, it's his uncle. No, that doesn't excuse it. But David listens, and David's heart is changed. It says, so the king got up and took his seat in the gateway. When, all, when the men were told the king is sitting in the gateway, they all came before him. A little observation here about David. You know that sometimes you will not take advice from some people. Well, you don't understand that. You know, the guy's an idiot anyway. I don't have to listen to him. This guy is a lousy boss. He is unfair. He treats this person as a favorite. And now he's trying to tell me how to do my job. I'm not listening to him. David was the kind of person, and this is really in his favor, that he would listen even to his enemies. And he would wonder, okay, where's the truth in this? Is he right? If he's right, I will listen to him. He did not dismiss Joab right away as if, you know, he has no right to speak to me like this. David is thick-skinned. David is confident about himself. And he is willing to listen and listen to people who he even does not respect or he is angry with. And that's so he does with, with this situation with Joab. Then David goes and gives thanks to them for their courage that is to his soldiers. They longed for him to come and speak to them. They needed him to put it all in perspective for them. To say to them that they did well. And that he indeed appreciates them. And is glad that they are part of his army. And that he understands the risks that they took. And he says that's huge and I'm really, really grateful. And then they, you know, they're ready to go away now. They're feeling like they've done something that's been appreciated. Another really good thing about David, being able to confirm people and to say to them, you know what, you're important to me. He had lost that because of his grief. He had that face covered and wasn't seeing it. But once he repented and once he was told about it, he went right to his men. And even though probably it was with tears running down his face, very difficult for him to say, he wanted to express to them how much he appreciated that. We need to learn to do this. We are here oft times expect people to do things, but we don't expect ourselves to give thanks. One of the things I remember about Dad was just that. He was the kind of person who would always give thanks to people. He would commend them on the good job they did when a waitress uh, waited on him. He would look for things that to say to her. Even the food that he ate in the part of the wing that he was in, you know, it really wasn't that good. Meter and I ate with him, you know, and sometimes institutional food can be kind of, well, you know, kind of, yeah, you know. Anyway, he, he would say, every meal that I have here, I find something in it that is really good to me. That means there are about two or three things that weren't. But that isn't what he focuses on. And he spends the time, you know, affirming people, telling them that he was grateful and stuff like that. Isn't it the way God wants us to be? Isn't that what Jesus does for us? We speak about in the coming time when we go to be before him that he will be giving rewards. He will speak to us about the appreciation that he has for the way in which we served him. We want to be like him. We're trying to become his image. And so to do that, we are going to need to encourage people more and more, especially as the day is approaching. And we're going to need to tell them what they're doing right and how much it means to us. We're so easy to pick out things that are not right and what we don't like. Let's change all that and be ready to talk to people about what they do right. So let's look at a parallel of Jesus in this story here. He grieves too over the loss of Israel. As David was grieving, and you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, David was doing it all wrong. 
He was forgetting those that were, he was responsible for and he was covering his face and weeping loudly and all consumed with himself. How can that possibly be a parallel to Jesus? You remember when Jesus comes on the Mount of Olives and looks over at Jerusalem, he weeps for Jerusalem. This is very important to us because sometimes people look at the Old Testament and say, oh, the God of the Old Testament is, is, is harsh and he's mean and he's all these kinds of things. But that's not true at all. It's, he says, it gives me no pleasure to, to punish the wicked. He weeps over those who are dying. He weeps over his people. Jesus was physically an example of that for us. And that is what we see in David, too. Sure, Solomon, uh, Absalom was, uh, was a rebel and he was indeed worthy of death. David knew those things, but it grieved him. Not simply because it was his son, but primarily, yes, for sure. But also that, you know, anyone dying in that way, and well, it breaks his heart. And so we see this is a picture of Jesus, and Jesus pictures for us what God is like, because he is God in the flesh. So we see that picture of compassion. Never should we be kind of the person that pointed at somebody and say, I am so glad you got what you deserved. This whole triumphing over people. You see it in sports all the time. I'm going to get on a tangent here in a minute if I don't watch out. You know, when you see these football players tackle a guy and then stand over him going, no, 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 you know, that is so wrong. Uh, you and me don't agree with me about that, but, you know, where's the kindness here? Where's the fair play? And where's, you know, hey, we're uh, having a good game together and it's just a game and it doesn't matter. And I'm not going to all right, exalt over you. Okay, all right, I'm going to stop now. Okay. He does not hide his face during suffering. That's what Jesus parallels here too. He does not hide his face. That's a parallel. That's the opposite. As David covered his face, Jesus did not. He could have closed his eyes. That's generally what I do when I'm in the dentist chair. I close my eyes and I white knuckle the arms of the seat. That's the, what I do. Because I don't want to see it coming. I don't like what they do to me. And so, you know, I shut it out. People do this. You know, kind of, Jesus did not. He kept his eyes open, met needs, even as he hung on the cross. He appears to his disciples, as David did not appear first of all to his men, but later did appear to them. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, does not come to congratulate them for their victory, but comes to them to say, I have won the victory for you. You are so important to me. And now I have a job for you to do, to spread the gospel all over the world. And I'm going to be with you in that. Jesus is there. Even though they had deserted him, Jesus is there with them, picking them up, saying, let's get going because I have things for you to do. So David then does something very unusual. What would you think maybe he ought to have done or what you expected he would do? He has just won a great victory. His army has triumphed over Absalom's army. He is now in charge. Now what do you expect he's going to do? He's going to go back to Jerusalem, retake the throne, and be the king, right? Uh, i got a surprise for you. It isn't how it goes. Not at all. And the way he does it is very instructive. So the king got up and took a seat in the gateway. I'm sorry, I've already read that part. Verse 9. Meanwhile, this, the Israelites had fled to their homes. Throughout the tribes of Israel, the people were all arguing with each other, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of the en our enemies. He is the one who rescued us from the hand of the Philistines. But now he's fled to a country because of Absalom. And Absalom, whom we have anointed to rule over us, has died in battle. So why do you not say it? Why are you saying nothing about bringing the king back? This is what's going on here. You have the... Absalom's army disperses, flees, and they all go to their homes, hoping that nobody will remember that they actually were part of that army. They're afraid. And then they begin thinking about this. What should we be doing now? And some of them are saying to others, you know, guys, you know, David has been a good king to us. He fought our battles for us. He, he gave us victory over the Philistines who were continually plaguing us. Why are we not going out there and bringing him back? Now, it's very important that you notice that the first people that are mentioned here are the Israelites. You and I tend to think of the Israelites as all of Israel. Don't do that. 
Whenever it speaks of it here, the Israelites are the northern ten tribes, as opposed to Judah in the south. All right? So the northern ten tribes, who are most against David, are the first ones to be saying, we need to bring him back to make him king again. And read down further. Then King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Ask the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to this palace? Since what has been was said throughout Israel is, has reached the king at his quarters. You are my brothers, my own flesh and blood. So why should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my own flesh and blood? May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if from now on you are not the commander of my army in the place of Joab. So first you have the Israelites saying, you know what, we should be getting David back here. He's been a good king. I don't know what we were thinking. He should be king again. Why are you waiting? Get moving. Then we see David addressing the people in Judah. Why? Because they are not saying these things. Sometimes the people that you expect to be the closest and the most loyal to you turn out not to be. Have you ever found that to be true? Members of your own family turn against you? Have you had members or friends that at work that you never thought would ever say something about you and they end up doing that kind of thing? Making you look stupid in front of somebody else? Here we have Judah, who is David's home tribe. And they are not yet saying, we've got to bring David back. And he has heard, as he says here, I've heard that the Israelites in the north are actually talking about bringing me back. Why should you be the last? Now, you might say to yourself, well, that's interesting. I mean, after all, he is the king. He has the winning army. Why doesn't he just go back into Jerusalem, march into the city, and sit himself on the throne? He could do that, couldn't he? Yes, he could do that. Why is he going about it this way? Why is he waiting for the northern ten tribes to say, yes, we want you to come back? Why is he sending emissaries, Abiathar and Zadok, to the people in Judah? Incidentally, Abiathar and Zadok are not Judites, but they are well respected because they're high priests. And so he is saying to them, go and be my representative and, and persuade the people to ask me back. David, you don't have to do that. Just march in. Be the king. But don't you understand that David is fully cognizant that if he wants Israel to follow him as king, they must want him as king. If he just marches in and says, I am king, now I'm going to start you know, judging people and uh, killing those traitors. People will fear him, but they will not love him. And they will follow him because they have to, but they will not follow him because they love him. And one, there's one thing that's more powerful than fear, that is love. And so David wants them to want him to return. Now you say to yourself, why didn't he just go to his people in Judah himself? Because these two men could do it better. That's just something that causes us to have to swallow our pride sometimes. There are some people that we know who are more influential than we are. And sometimes it's better for us to ask them to intercede for us than it is for us to go in and just kind of make things happen ourselves. We may have the authority, we may have the right, whatever it may be, but it will not be as effective unless somebody else does it. Somebody that you know can. There are people here in this church I know who are movers and shakers more than I am. Yeah, I know that's hard to believe. But there are some people that when that person speaks, everybody listens. And it's not me. Now, most of you listen when I speak. And I'm grateful for that. But there are some people, if they got up here and just said, we ought to do this, everybody would be on board because they have a way and they are respected and they are loved by everyone. David knew this was true of Abiathar and Zadok. So he sends them. I don't have to be the one who gets all the glory. 
You guys go in there and speak to them and, and persuade them to let me come back. And then he adds some things that will help them in that process. He says, first of all, don't you guys realize that you are my flesh and blood? You see, they're afraid that as his flesh and blood, that they have been traitors to him. They've gone along with this, this coup that tried to happen. And they're afraid that maybe he's going to judge them. And they should be judged the worst because they were the ones that belonged to his tribe. And so they're worried about this. And he says, no, 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 no. The fact that you are my own kin and my own blood, flesh and blood means that I want you. And I want you to be the first to bring me back. And I'll tell you what else. Amasa. And you all know who Amasa is, right? I see blank looks on your face. It's not good. Amasa was the general under Absalom, remember? He led the charge against David. And David says, you know, may I be cursed if I don't make Amasa my head general in the place of that loose cannon, Joab. He didn't say loose cannon. But then, what is he communicating when he says that? He said, well, they're thinking, if we're, we're in trouble because we had been in fighting against David, if David can, can, can forgive Amasa and make him the main general, then surely he will forgive us too. Isn't that smart? That is very smart. And so it says, after he says those things, he, verse 14, he won over the hearts of all the men of Judah as though they were one man. And they sent word to the king, return you and all your men. It worked. It worked. He waited. He was patient. He could have gone right into Jerusalem, but he waited and he was patient and they decided to ask him to return and they would meet him at the Jordan. And that's where we're going next. And they come enthusiastically. They want him back as king. That is the best scenario possible. And David was wise enough to wait for it and to cause it to happen. He didn't just hope it would happen. He did things like sending the two priests to make sure that it did happen. I think this is really, really important. How's that parallel Jesus? How's that parallel Jesus? Here we have king of glory attacked by the world put on a cross and slain in the most horrific way imaginable and he rises from the dead and he comes back now he has the authority he has the power to go right into Jerusalem put himself on the throne and become the king but like David his kingdom is a kingdom of people who desire him. And so, as David sent the priests, Jesus sends the priests. The priesthood of all believers. You are his ambassadors. He says, go to my people. Persuade them to come. Because I want those to come who want me to be their king. So we see the parallel, and it's very important, isn't it? This whole passage has been about forgiveness, and I only have five minutes left, so I'm not going to proceed any further until next week. But here we have the, the pure and easy-to-see opportunity for, for David to get revenge, to come down hard on people. But this passage here and the one that's coming, as he, he speaks to Shimei, to Mephibosheth, and others... He shows love and forgiveness and desire that they would be restored. I, I'm of the opinion that Jesus wants the same in this world too. That he wants his family brought in. That he wants them to be restored. Yes, they are guilty. They are rebels. They have fought against him. They have killed him on the cross. Yet still... He wants them to acknowledge him as king and want him to rule over them in love. We are then his ambassadors to make it happen.
There are some people out there in this world around us that cause us to be afraid and not want to be those ambassadors. We have a number of international people that we are beginning to know and to love here in our community. There's a new group that's, that, that's you know, we're just beginning to see the Lord's leading in working uh, to reach out to Muslims. And that's what our, our missions conference is going to be coming uh, in October is going to be about. We're all afraid of Muslims here in the United States because of the terrorists and because of radicals and things like that that are having the loudest words and, and doing the most radical things, it's unspeakable things. And it's easy for us then to say, we're not going to relate to them. We have no idea. We can't trust them. They're trying to take over the United States and things like that. I don't know what their full agenda is, but I tell you what, that it's Jesus' agenda that will prevail. It is his, prevent, his, his agenda that we are to follow. And he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to those that you think probably are amenable and likable and to those that you're just terrified of. So we need to be thinking about this. If David could make Amasa his general... Can we not also reach out as Jesus took those who deserted him and those who put him on the cross and prayed for them? So also should we. That should be something we'll take away from this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you certainly have uh, taken us who are rebels. And we tend to think of ourselves in much more generous terms. But Lord, in and it gets right down to it. If it was not for you, we would not be here. That's just the simple truth. And so because of you, we can sing salvation song. We can worship you. And we look forward to the day when we will do so without any, any limitations. And so Lord, I pray, help us to enter into the fray. To do that which is required of us to bring those who need you to you, that our family might grow. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.